Okay, Steph. Hello, everybody. We'll just let everybody enter the room as this loads up for the folks joining from all across North America and probably beyond. I think yesterday we had someone joining in from Africa. And so from wherever you're joining in, hello. I'll just wait 10 seconds or so for everybody to enter the room and then we will get started. All right, in the interest of time, we're gonna get going here. Um, my name is Stephanie Krolik. I'm the program coordinator for Take Me Outside. And maybe you were with us yesterday for the first day of Take Me Outside week. We had two amazing presentations yesterday. Uh, so welcome back if you are part of that or if you've been to one of our webinars or uh, workshops before. And if you're just joining us now for the first time, welcome. It's so lovely to have you here either way. And thanks for joining us. This is day two of Take Me Outside week. And I think it's our 12th year also of just of Take Me Outside day. It's only in the past couple of years become a whole week, but uh, it's just, it's so fun to have everybody joining us and um, participating and hopefully getting outside as well, of course. But uh, if you're unfamiliar with Take Me Outside, that's our whole goal. That's our whole mission is to encourage learners and educators to spend more time outdoors and to have that time be a regular part of everyday learning. And for myself, I'm joining in from Vancouver Island uh, in British Columbia. And that land where I live, uh, where I grew up, is unceded Coast Salish territory, uh, where the Coatzin people, the Cowichan tribes, and the Holcomenum speaking people have been living and stewarding this land since time immemorial. So I'm very grateful to be joining you from that land today. Please feel free to write in the chat where you're joining from um, and you know your grade or anything like that that you want to add into the chat. We'll get started in a, in a minute here. I'll pass it off. And just do a quick intro, um, I will introduce Ryan, who will introduce Josh. And then at the end, we also have some amazing prizes to give away. So if you can stay for the full hour, we really encourage you to do that and hope you can do that. So outdoor learning comes with amazing benefits, uh, mind, body, spirit, the whole, the whole thing. So you know, if you're new to outdoor learning, maybe you've been noticing some of those changes and, you know, getting outside and encouraging you to be physically active while you're spending time in nature. Um, it's an amazing way to just be spending time and moving your body. And that's what we'll be talking about today. And so while this webinar is online, our team at Take Me Outside and PHE Canada, we structured it to give you an opportunity to learn something new while also getting some healthy bouts of physical activity. So we encourage you beyond this workshop to, but to you know, take this and also take it outside, breathe in the fresh air, detach from screens, all that good stuff during your breaks um, and during your class time too. So today we have Ryan here from PHE Canada, who will be helping to facilitate today's live event. Uh, PHE Canada is a nonprofit charitable organization which empowers the PHE community with quality programs, professional development services, and community activations to ensure equitable access to the benefits of quality education and health education and healthy learning environments. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Ryan here or let him introduce himself, actually. So I'll pass it off to you. Okay, thank you, Stephanie and the Take Me Outside team. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in here today. This is going to be a fun time together. As Stephanie mentioned, uh, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead for special projects and resources at Physical and Health Education Canada. And I'm honored to be one of the hosts here today. I'm grateful to be joining you from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people, also known as Ottawa. So I am a runner, I'm an educator and a Spartan racer, and I enjoy exploring the trails all around Ottawa, especially this time of year. It is beautiful here. Uh, I like to move 30 to 60 minutes every day, preferably outside because it makes me feel great and it keeps me healthy. Physical activity is such an important part of who I am and it's an important part of my life. And that's why I'm honored to be able uh, to be able to be here today as part of Take Me Outside Week. In today's live session, we have a special guest who happens to know a thing or two about volleyball, education, 
healthy living, and being physically active. In a minute, we will hear from our speaker who will share his physical activity journey and how he has overcome challenges throughout his Olympic career. Following his presentation, like Stephanie mentioned, uh, he'll be taking us through a couple of physical activities, one that will be modified from our PHE Canada Learning Centre, which is a game traditionally played outside by the Inuit. He will also take us through a foundational volleyball movement skill, which can be done outside, in the gym, in the classroom, or on the volleyball court. At any time, if you have questions, uh, feel free to submit them to Josh using the chat function on your screen, and we will do our best as a team here to make sure we answer as many questions as possible during the time that we have. Also, educators, feel free to take some photos, uh, share them, tag uh, Take Me Outside, PHE Canada, and Josh Binstock who I'll introduce in a minute. We would love to um, uh, see some of these activities happening on social media. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our main speaker for today's live event, Josh uh, Binstock. Josh made his Olympic debut at the 2012 Olympic Games in London alongside Martin Reeder, where they finished within the top 20 in the world. Since teaming up in 2013, Josh and his teammate, Sam Shacker, have stood on the podium at four international volleyball world tour events, highlighted by a gold medal at the 2014 Piranha Open. Josh and Sam have also competed at the International, world, uh, international Volleyball World Championships in 2015, where they finished as Canada's top ranked men's team. Josh also went on to compete at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games for Team Canada as well. Some other accomplishments that I should mention uh, about Josh are the following 2001 Canada Games silver medalist and he's a three-time national champion. Some other fun facts about Josh. Josh, as you can tell by his background that you'll see here in a minute, has a doctorate of chiropractic from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College uh, and is joining us here today in between sessions, which we're very grateful for. And Josh likes beach volleyball because it is more difficult to be successful in and it's more cognitive. And we know that there's a, a real uniqueness to that sport. And I also think he likes it because it's done outside. So with that, Josh, I want to welcome you, turn it over to you and let's have some fun. Welcome. Amazing. Thanks so much, Ryan. I, uh, I was reliving my, my glory days there, so I appreciate that. Um, hello, everyone. <clears throat> I uh, wish I could see you all, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, sense, I'll sense the energy and, and the presence from everyone. Um, so I'm super excited to, to share my physical literacy story today um, on behalf of obviously Take Me Outside Week and PHE Canada. So um, and just before I start, for those of you that either haven't seen beach volleyball high level or understand the particular physical literacy movements that are in beach volleyball, because, you know, we all probably have played volleyball of some sort uh, at school in the past. Uh, beach is a little different. It's two versus two and it's on the sand. And like Ryan said, it's outdoor in the sun. So that that's an added benefit. Um, so I just have a kind of a, a little highlight video uh, put together for you just so you can get a sense um, of what it's like to um, see it from the, you know, the inside and uh, from the Olympics and get a, a vibe of the energy of what the sport's like and also watch the movements. So um, let me uh, go with share PowerPoint, okay. Bear with my technical thing, okay. All right, uh, we, success to see my, okay, good. All right, so here's the highlight video. Here he is, the Dr. Josh Binstock, who's a, a chiropractor practicing, actually, not in the, but in the volleyball season, but uh, in the off season. Uh, and his partner, both from Richmond Hill, Sam Schachter. Big block by Josh Binstock on Alice's son in Canada is within a point of Brazil. Well, Binstock, very tactical up at the net. He will try to read the body language of the attacker 
And at the last second, he jumps out towards the line and seals it very well. Good penetration from Bidstock. And the block from Bidstock. It's in. Canada's got set point. That's Brazil. Great read by Bidstock. Serves the big horse line. And Bidstock reaches up with this big block. I get a little excited sometimes. Point for Canada, leading by three. That's the name of the game, put pressure on your opponents. <laughs> in this case, Schachter counts as one of your three contacts. Bidstock actually tried to put that over. Instead, it turned into a perfect set, but unfortunately, Canada called for four contacts. Attack off the block. Doppler's attack off Binstock. Binstock reaches. And Doppler tries the one hand dig, doesn't work. Canada's tied it up again. Great save from Bidstock right here on the open hand dig on the drive from Clemens Doppler. And Schachter does a great job to put him up to the net. And off balance attack from Bidstock. Not much discussion in the timeout area of the Canadians. Karambula dug up by Binstock. Pounds it down. Three point lead, Canada. Well, a turn of events in the second set. Italy frustrated by the way that challenge, video challenge, went down, and it's resulted in a couple of extra points. Canada, on the strength of that dig, and Another hard serve, but Rangieri pulls it up, and then Binstock blocks it down. Italy tries for a quick set, usually seen indoors. Rangieri certainly has some indoor background, but Binstock... Forget how... Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Is the audio... Can you hear me? I uh, may want to turn up your volume a little bit there, Josh. Okay. Okay. Um, something. There he is, the doctor. Okay. Um, how about now? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I forget uh, <laughs> how emotional I look then there. You know, sometimes when they're telling you, it's for those of you that play sports, um, you know, you're, you're told sometimes to have a poker face so your opponent doesn't know what you're thinking. But I tried that. That's just not me. I wear my heart on my sleeve. So um, for those of you who are maybe told that too, just, you know, you do you or whatever comes out, you, could, you realize it looks kind of fun afterwards. Um, so I just wanted to take you through a couple other experiences from the Olympics. A lot of people ask me what my favorite moment was, and it's tough to obviously say one, but I would say the moment I came out um, of the tunnel with the rest of my delegation in the opening ceremonies, that was something that I had you know, been thinking about and dreaming about when I was your age. And at the time, your age, it seemed like something so unfathomable. And, you know, there's no way it's going to happen. But when you are setting your goals and your dreams, set them big. You know, you don't have to share them with people if you want. You can uh, write it down. You know, that's putting into the universe, manifesting and making it real. Um, because you really do have the potential to achieve those goals. Um, as long as, you know, you do the hard work and sacrifice and everything goes with it. But um, this is a picture I took. You can kind of see all the blue seats. Uh, those are people in there. So that was just a moment that I got goosebumps because um, I was finally there after dreaming about it for so long. Um, <laughs> here's kind of a funny picture. You can kind of see maybe the dancer in the middle smiling at me uh, because he knows that we were lost. He doesn't look too impressed. We were on the stage during the uh, performance. We didn't mean to be. We should have been on the outside. Uh, but we were trying to leave. Uh, our coach said, we've been standing long enough. We were there for the introduction. Now we should go to bed. And uh, we got lost in the middle. So I just took a quick picture because I thought that was funny. Um, here's another video I'm taking. Uh, you'll have to, I wasn't the most steady with the camera. My apologies, I was a little excited, but just to get a sense of what it's like when you come out uh, and you're walking into the opening ceremonies with your country. Uh, my mouse seems to be gone. There we go. Okay.
Yeah, apologies for the camera um, shakiness, but I wanted to get you a, a feel of what it's like to be walking in there. Um, this is the, our moose, of course, the uh, Canadian emblem. Uh, they put that up in front of our residence and uh, a lot of people wanted to come and take pictures of that. Um, it was pretty cool. This is inside the village, which I thought that was another favorite part of mine because the village is only for athletes and coaches. And you're meeting, you know, people from around the world that you get to connect with, learn about their cultures, learn about their way of life in their country, how it's similar, how it's different. Um, but you share that common uh, values of how important physical literacy is to you all around the world. And it's something that uh, I really cherish being able to connect with those athletes. Um, here's our residence. You know, you could decorate any way you want. I think ours was a pretty uh, unique and cool um, way we did that, but of course, maybe a little biased. Um, there's some other ones. You can see the Netherlands there, Portugal. So it's kind of like a little mini community in a, in a global setting. So it was very unique. Um, here's a shot of the venue. Um, like Ryan was saying, I played in 2012, which was London, which was uh, amazing at the time. Obviously the queen was still with us and it was the horse guards parade. So it was right beside um, the Buckingham Palace. So that was pretty special. And here we're in Rio where Brazil, you know, next to soccer, beach volleyball is the main uh, sport. So it was pretty incredible to be on the beach there playing in front of that many people. And um, here's kind of like the final, um, you know, uh, video I have just to get a feel of what it's like inside the opening ceremonies live. So you can imagine the, uh, the energy was electric. And, um, and so, you know, obviously being there was an incredible experience and a lot went into that. Um, but what I want to share with you today about that journey is the physical literacy aspect and what I really learned and, and took from that because, you know, obviously it's taking me outside week. And for those, you know, you might have heard that word physical literacy, but those that aren't totally sure of what that means, it's, it's more physical literacy is like a journey, um, which you, you know, you develop the knowledge and the attitudes that you, that enable you to participate in a wide variety of activities. So it doesn't have to be sports. It can be, but, um, you know, it can be anything else like, you know, the Spartan races, which is pretty uh, impressive that Ryan was doing. And, um, yeah, you know, you can be solo with the team inside, outside, all kinds of activities is what physical literacy um, is relating to and it's not only the physical movement part of it it's not only us moving it's also the motivation like the mental aspect of it um, and you know how it gives you confidence uh, being physical literate um, and it's the the knowledge and understanding um, you know to value and take responsibility for engaging in physical activity so not only is it how uh, what's your quality of movement um, but also how motivated are you to take responsibility for yourself to make sure that movement uh, is part of your lifestyle. And uh, there are, you know, four elements to physical literacy. And I just want to go over them quickly because I just want all of us to understand how important um, these elements are to having uh, physical literacy and just attempting it. So the first one is motivation and confidence. So like I said, physical literacy, uh, yes, it's physical, but the motivation and confidence that comes with moving and being active uh, is called the effective part. And that just refers to our enthusiasm and our enjoyment, um, you know, in adopting the physical activity as an integral part of our life. So how much do we love and how much are we passionate, enthusiastic about moving or being active? Um, the next uh, element is the physical component, our, our competence. And that just really refers to our ability to develop those movement skills and movement patterns and the capacity to experience a variety of movements of intensities and duration. So you can do something like a quick jump, like volleyball, which is high intense, short duration, or the marathon, which is a long duration and low intensity. So it's a wide, wide variety. Uh, the third component is knowledge and understanding, which is the cognitive part. And cognitive is relating to our brain. Um, and that's just the ability to identify uh, and express the essential qualities that influence our movement. Um, and it's also about understanding the health benefits physical and mental health benefits of having an active lifestyle. Uh, and the last one is the behavioral part. It's really just, like I said before, prioritizing 
have, being physically active in your life? And are, do you make time and do you make conscious time to make sure that you're being active a certain amount of time every day? And the, one of the greatest things about physical activity and physical literacy is that you know, there are really endless possibilities um, and, and there will be an activity to suit almost everybody. So yes, you know, I competed at the Olympics in beach volleyball. However, I believe that it was because obviously I had other aspects, but a main, main reason was because I had those four elements of physical literacy um, and started that journey at your age. So, you know, at your age, I was just trying to be physically literate. I, I didn't know about the Olympics. Obviously I saw it and it was amazing, but really I just wanted to be physically literate at your age. And, you know, I don't think it was because I started playing only volleyball at a young age and specialized in it early. And I think that's a really important um, message because I, I hear, you know, I played as many sports as I could. And I think that's what physical literacy is all about is trying all different sports, all different activities when you're younger um, and seeing what you like, what you don't like and learning different movement patterns. Um, and so myself, I played hockey in the winter, mostly baseball in the summer, but you know, I played everything I could, like soccer, badminton, basketball, table tennis, rode my bike, went on rollerblades. Um, because when I speak to schools and I often get asked from students, you know, who would love to represent Canada one day at the Olympics, because uh, they think that they need to play their sports so much so early to get to the top level. Uh, and they ask me, when did you start playing volleyball and specializing? Um, and you know, now specializing means to only play one sport uh, or activity uh, and do only that one sport and focus on that before grade 11. Okay, so that's what specializing early means, before grade 11. So they're shocked to hear that it wasn't until the summer between kind of grade 11 and grade 12 where I started specializing in beach volleyball and volleyball. And I'm not the, uh, you know, the rare case. It's, it's not uncommon at all to, um, as statistics uh, show that over half of professional athletes in North American sports did not specialize early, which I don't know if you would think that. You would think that most of the professional athletes did specialize early, like I said. And the stats, there's research, and I'd be happy to provide that if you want to reach out after I can give you the studies and, and evidence of that. Um, so, if, you know, if you want to get a scholarship, uh, if you want a high level, if you want to play in university or be professional one day, uh, you know, if you, if you specialize early in sports, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's increasing your chances of doing that at a professional level or university level. In fact, uh, research as well, not my opinion, research shows that early specialization, because I'm on the health side as well, um, if you early specialize in one sport or activity that actually leads to a higher rate of injury, you would think it'd be surprisingly. In fact, 1.7 times more likely to get injured if you specialize early in one sport. So that just shows you how important it is physically to play all kinds of sport and be, be physically literate and a variety of activities. And lastly, um, but just as importantly, uh, for the mental aspect, you know, early specialization is linked to psychological burnout. And I'm not sure if you've heard of that or if you've experienced that. I know we have student athletes and students from a wide range of ages today, but uh, I played hockey growing up and I played baseball in the summer, but many of my friends wanted to go to the NHL and they played hockey in the summer as well. And they played it all year round and they were talented enough to make it, but they were psychologically burnt out because they didn't play anything else. And they ended up not achieving their goal, not because they weren't good enough, because they, did, they lost the passion. So being physically literate in a bunch of different activities will help you keep your passion for whatever sport if you do want to be professional. Um, now, you know, I'm sure we've all heard the benefits of, of uh, physical exercise in terms of the physical aspect. Um, like, you know, it'll strengthen your bones, it'll strengthen your muscles, it makes you stronger when, you, when you're physically active, so you can run faster, you know, jump higher, um, kick, spike, shoot harder, all those things, you, you'll, you'll probably be better at doing whatever your activity is if you're racing or playing a sport. Um, however, it also actually strengthens your immune system as well, physical activity. So that will help you reduce the chances of getting sick as well. Um, but not only is being physically literate, obviously active for our physical health, but it's very important for our mental health as well. Um, which, you know, these days, it's always very important, but especially now after what we went through with the pandemic, uh, I'm sure we've all been affected mentally um, with, you know, some during the peak of that when we were locked down and uh, some of our organized sports uh, were taken away from us. And that, in many of us, brings joy and, and mental health in a positive way to us. So when that's removed from us, that affects our mental health. 
So now that we are back open and able to be physically literate, um, that is something right there alone that can make us feel happier and increase our mental health. Um, now, kind of, you know, for those of you not sure what I mean by mental well-being, because today's topic is obviously health and well-being, um, it's not like there's one single definition of what mental well-being means, but it kind of encompasses a bunch of factors, uh, like just the sense of feeling good about ourselves, you know, and being able to function well uh, by ourselves if we're alone and function well with if we're in a group. So uh, it's also, you know, the ability to deal with the ups and downs of life, because we all know, you know, sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad, we're not always happy. And, um, you know, that mental well-being it allows us to cope with those challenges um, and make the most of the opportunities. And, you know, I'll talk about the challenges I had to go through myself, um, physically and mentally, that I didn't thought would make my Olympic dream uh, not a reality. And you will find, and I, I do this talk um, with other athletes in schools, how important being resilient is. And we'll kind of go over, you know, what that means. But, um, you know, the mental health, it, the stronger you are resilience-wise, that the better mental health state you're in. Um, it also, you know, mental health well-being, it talks about the feeling of connection to people, whether it's your friends, your family, just your community around there. Um, the more you connect it is, the more of a mental uh, well-being state you're in. And finally, it's kind of having a sense of purpose in your life. You know, you feel like you kind of matter and, and uh, you're feeling loved and you're feeling valued. And that's also will contribute to mental well-being. So that's kind of like an encompassing definition uh, of what that means. Now, of course, mental well-being doesn't mean being happy all the time, like I talked about. Um, you know, obviously, that would be great, especially in the light of social media these days. Uh, a lot of people portray that everything's great and happy, but the reality is we're not always happy all the time, no matter even if they do portray that. So um, it doesn't mean that you're not going to experience some sad emotions once in a while, and that's part of normal life. Um, but, you know, research shows that being physically active will help you lead to deal with that, those sad emotions and it, and it helps lead to a mentally healthier life um, and it will improve your mental well-being. So the fact that uh, physically active, which is fun and will help with that, is kind of like an easy uh, and fun way to, to help stay mentally uh, well. Um, now, physical literacy and physical activity, it also has an impact on our mood. You know, sometimes, you know, we're in a good mood, sometimes we're not in a good mood. Um, but being physically active, uh, again, research shown they uh, would would take people that were active and then not and talk about their mood and they found that after they were physically active um, it had a positive impact on their mood and it impacts our stress obviously again sometimes we're stressed you know we have different things with school we have tests coming up we have, you know family friends uh, whatever it is that in life that's going to come up and uh, physical physical activity um, will help with that because sometimes we feel like we're upset um, and our body in defense of that, I'm not going to get into the science, but it releases cortisol and some kind of um, chemicals that cause us to feel like butterflies in our stomach and tightness in our chest sometimes. And physical activity will help relieve the, those feelings. So we also may experience emotions happy uh, more intensely when we're physically fit. So, you know, physical exercise can be very effective uh, in relieving that stress. And one that I underestimated, well, I just really didn't realize, once I found out, I really uh, made sure I was physically active during my studying uh, because it, it uh, helps with your brain boost, boost your brain power, physical activity, which we know it new boosts our muscle power, but who would, why would it boost our brain power? Um, and it strengthens your memory. So uh, in a number of ways, and you know, studies indicate that cardiovascular exercise, so pretty much any you know, medium to long-term exercise creates new brain cells, uh, it's that's called neurogenesis and uh, it improves overall brain performance. So whether you have a presentation or you have a test coming up or you have an important conversation you want to have or something where you need to be alert um, or study, the reason it does that is because it, it increases your concentration and alertness and it helps you retain information, which means you'll be able to study better. So if you go for a run and then you come back and study, just try it. I'm telling you, you'd be so surprised how much more engaged you'll be. If you break up your studying, which is a whole nother thing, because I had to try to uh, compete on the world tour while doing my chiropractic degree. So I really had to be efficient in how I could, you know, absorb the information. Um, so it'll help you do better on assignments and tests because exercise pumps blood. You're pumping blood through your muscles, but it also pumps blood through your brain. And that has oxygen and oxygen helps you function. Um, so it can help you think more clearly uh, by increasing the size of your hippocampus. Hippocampus is just a fancy word. Um, that's the part of your brain that's responsible for memory. 
So long and short of that exercise uh, helps memory. Um, and it also helps our self-esteem. You know, self-esteem means how we feel about ourselves. Um, and, you know, not only obviously does it have a physical impact on our, our physical uh, self-esteem, but also our mental, uh, mental uh, self-esteem. It's how we perceive, you know, our self-worth. So uh, physical activity has been shown to positively influence our self-esteem and our self-worth. And I alluded to earlier, um, it impacts, you know, a depression and anxiety. And obviously, like I said, with the pandemic recently, um, rates of that and many more people are experiencing depression and anxiety and physical activity helps reduce that anxiety. Um, and it's the greatest thing is physical activity is available to all, no matter where you're from, what your you know, socioeconomic status is or what your um, resources are. You can go outside and you can go in your basin or whatever, jumping jacks, run around, go for a walk, go for a hike. And all that really does help um, reduce you know, anxiety. Uh, you know, it's, it's free and it, it's such an empowering approach uh, that can support your own self-management. So yes, we always, there's other managements where we're dealing with anxiety to talk to people and that helps. But this is one great self-management um, aspect that you can do yourself. Um, I mean, not to mention the other amazing benefits that come with being active uh, with people like uh, benefits of team building, which is really important. Um, you know, being a leader, uh, becoming resilient, like I talked about, overcoming adversity. And those are all very important life skills that if you haven't already experienced why you need them, you will very soon. So um, that will be, uh, it's a very applying on the field of life as well. Um, and, you know, now that me, many of you have experienced that in some capacity the last couple of years, like I said, with the pandemic, um, our activities, you know, being shut down. So that's very important that we maximize that. Um, and I shared that myself. Now, it wasn't uh, during the pandemic because, you know, I was still able to go outside like we all were in my, my organized sports weren't shut down because I was retired. However, I had shoulder surgery. Um, I, I hurt my shoulder so bad that I needed surgery. That was after university before chiropractic school. And the surgeon says, you need surgery. You probably won't play volleyball at a high level again. I thought my dreams were crushed. I was very upset, depressed, had a lot of anxiety. And it was, you know, sad for everybody when you, the sports and activities got shut down during the pandemic, but at least everybody was in the same boat together. With me, it was almost worse only because all my friends and colleagues, and they were still playing while I was stuck in a sling in pain on my couch for many months on end. And I was, you know, not in a good mental state. Um, and it, it was, you know, sad to say the least. Um, and that lasted for a year. However, um, when I did come back, you know, you have to just keep optimistic, you know, when things aren't going well, sometimes in life, you got, it will be, it will. And you have to have that forward thinking of optimism and you have to force it sometimes. And sometimes it's tough. It's easy to feel that way when things are going well. Um, but when I did get back uh, to playing, I can't tell you, one, I thought I wasn't going to be able to be at a high level. And I was only because I had a renewed uh, vigor, um, motivation, um, joy for, for being active because it was taken away from me. So I almost took for granted playing something that I always was able to do. Um, so, you know, I experienced what you all experienced as well with, you know, not being able to play. So if you haven't experienced that, um, which is great, but it really just gives you appreciation of how fortunate you are to be able to be physically active in all kinds of different ways. Um, and when I talked about resilience earlier, resilience, I just, it just means the ability to recover. You know, it can be a recover from anything. You know, if you have a cold, how fast can you get better? If you didn't do well on a test, how fast can you uh, study and then, you know, do well on the next test? If you lose a game, if you don't do well in a race, how fast can you recover? Um, so it's just your ability to overcome that adversity and recover from um, something negative. So, um, you know, I've, I've kind of spoken a lot about um, how important it is physical literacy is for me and, and obviously yourself. So now I want to get into an activity um, and I want to get you all moving at the same time. So how about, um, I chose an activity and like I said earlier, um, we have a ride a range of, of ages with our students here today. So I chose one kind of in the middle, you know, so you can uh, increase the difficulty if you, if you want to challenge yourself more, or you can decrease the difficulty um, if it's a little too difficult. So maybe I'll let Ryan come in and explain it first, and then uh, we, can, we can all do it together after. Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> I have so many questions too, but we'll, we'll do these activities first. So for schools who are tuning in here today, um, 
you can do this activity right in your classroom, which is really nice. You could also take it outdoors. Uh, Josh and I are actually going to be facilitating this from our kind of remote uh, areas and in his office. Um, but the activity actually comes from our PHE Canada Learning Centre, uh, which has over 250 activities uh, from K to 12 that you can take and use in your classroom or gymnasium. And the activity is actually called Kneel Jump. And this activity is designed, like Josh mentioned, kind of uh, for that middle school range, but it can be adapted for older grades, younger grades. Uh, and the activity is traditionally known as being an activity played by the Inuit and passed down by the Inuit. Um, and the context of the activity is that, you know, as, as uh, folks were preparing meat that they had hunted, they may have to move really quickly away from other predators also coming to get that meat. And so this was a reality for, for many folks. And so the activity really stems from those stories. And essentially what we're going to do is students in your, in your class, um, if you just want to find a space, comfortable space in your classroom, uh, we want to get all the students on the floor and you want to be sitting, I believe, uh, on your knees with your bum touching the back of your foot and your toes on the ground. So if we can start from that position, uh, that would be great. And then uh, we can go from there through the activity. So again, just to repeat, uh, you wanna find a space in your classroom. Uh, you wanna be on the floor, knees on the floor, and then bums are on the heels of your feet with your toes kind of facing, uh, to toes aren't touching the ground like this. They're kind of uh, pointed out behind the back of your body. So you can see Josh has this demonstrated really, really well. Um, so you can see the toes are kind of pointed back towards the wall. Uh, from that position, Josh, you want me to keep going or do you want to jump in? No, you're doing great. I'll try to maybe do uh, the, the uh, demonstration as you do the uh, explanation. Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> how it works is uh, say you're on the ground, you're preparing meat, picture yourself preparing something on the ground. Um, you want to get from where you're at on your knees to your feet. And so the challenge is getting from your knees to your feet without falling over. Um, and this, uh, so make sure, you know, you don't have any desks around or anything like that. Make sure you have lots of, lots of space around you. But essentially what Josh is going to demonstrate for us is he is going to be in this position, knees on the ground, arms to the side, and he's going to swing his arms. And as he swings his arms forward, from back to forward, he is going to maybe do a couple swings just to get a little bit of momentum, okay? And then maybe on the third swing, what he's going to do is he's going to try to land from his being on his knees to being on his feet. So he's gonna be in a really deep squat position. So Josh, we'll count you down. One, right. two, three. <laughs> I, you, for those of you that might have some bad knees or on a hard ground, you can put something kind of soft, maybe either, either if you can't go all the way on your back, you can put some kind of pillow or cushion so you don't have to go as far. Or if you uh, have to do um, um, something on the ground, you can put your knees on there as well. So let's let me try that again. Yeah, Josh, I'll get you to talk us through just because I see in the chat function that I think the way the screens work when I'm talking, my screen, like I'm not sure if folks can see your screen. So I'll mute, but uh, schools, just repeating the same steps. And this time you'll be able to see uh, Josh demonstrate the activity. And I've, I've spotlighted Josh here, so it should hopefully override and spotlight it for everybody. And feel oh, free to change you and you might be able to change the view individually for folks watching um clicking the view button so but we should be good here okay so what would be good to do uh like josh mentioned with that modification is really great in your classrooms uh work with your students to try to see if students can do this activity at least once so going from the the knees to the feet and then if you have students that are able to do that successfully Try to do it two or three times. So maybe we'll just take a couple minutes um, and Josh will do maybe one more demo 
And in your classroom, see if you can get your students to do this maybe one, two, or even three times. All right. One, two, oh, three. Oh. You really got to time it right, because if you don't get the arm swing, it kind of doesn't help jump. So I'll do that one more. One, two, three. Let's see how much, how far I got. Oh, I got a little farther, but not too far. So you want to see how far you get from your knees to the back where you land. So I started there. And then maybe you can even try um, going to the side. I don't know. Is that possible? There we go. So that's a really nice modification, actually, Josh. And back to what you were talking about with physical literacy, right? The whole idea of this activity being passed down through stories is just that physical literacy is part of survival, right? Part of resilience, part of being able to move quickly from a place of danger to a place of safety, right? Whether it's forward, backward, or side to side. And we know, like you mentioned in, in your talking with some of your research that, it, you know, mo moving in different patterns, different directions is super important when you're developing your physical literacy. Um, and so just to connect this with your sport of volleyball, uh, would this be kind of something that you would have to be doing a little bit in your sport as well? Going kind of from these really low positions, side to side, forward, back. Is that something you would be doing quite a bit in your sport? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's why it's actually this activity works perfect as a uh, <clears throat> kind of segue to my volleyball activity because we're using the exact same thing, the arm thrust pump to help get yourself up in the air quick um, and the, the movement of being explosive <clears throat> so but a lot of times we seem like kind of you know we have to be low also i will say in addition not only uh is it important to do a bunch of activities early even if you want to be professional in anything because yes it avoids the burnout but i've seen that athletes can make these amazing plays in their sport that other people who specialize can't because like ryan was alluding to they didn't learn those different types of movement patterns so sometimes, I don't know, if you were a, a soccer goalie growing up and then you see in the volleyball court, they want to play a professional volleyball player and they're able to dive to their side and dig a ball with their arm. It's like, you don't learn that in volleyball uh, lessons or, or training. We don't teach that, but that's just something a play you might have to do to keep the ball up. And if you don't have those different types of movements, you won't be able to make those plays. So that's why a lot of the professionals play a bunch of different sports because they're able to be dynamic make those different plays. So I just wanted to mention that as well. But yeah, you're always kind of down low. And in this area, in the ready position, you know, you gotta move side to side quick and kind of move back and forth. So it's kind of like a hunter gatherer kind of movement as well, for sure. Very cool. So for schools that are trying out the activity that have done, uh, done the kneel jump activity, I did drop the link in the chat box. So you can check that out. You could do it on recess, uh, lunchtime, during your breaks, take your kids outside, give it a try, send some pictures, tweet them to Josh and PHE Canada, take me outside. We'd love to see it. Uh, and we'd love to see any activities you take and do. So Josh, do you have a, another, maybe for folks tuning in that are really passionate about volleyball? Uh, they've watched you on TV before. Um, do you have maybe an activity that you want to share from your volleyball training? For sure. Um... Let's do the, uh, the spike approach. I know everybody loves, loves the spiking part of the volleyball and uh, it builds on the knee jumps, the kneel jumps that we just did. So um, I will show the right-handed. Uh, if it's left-handed, I'll show that as well, but it's just the opposite um, feet. So I don't know if you'll be able to see my face and my feet. So we'll see, I'll try to get as far as I can. Okay, most of it, that's okay. You've seen enough in my face. Um, can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, just nice and loud, but you're good. Okay, great. So the spike approach, I'm going to do one at the beginning and then I'll break it down. I'm going to open the door so I can. Okay. So arms up. 
Okay, I'll do that one more. Okay, so that's what it looks like in fast forward. So what I want everybody to do, if you're right-handed, you start on your left leg and, if, and you're just balancing. And if you're left-handed, you start on your right leg, okay? So this left leg you're standing on is responsible for the power and of generation of the approach. So I'm standing on the left leg. And remember with the needle jumps, we used our arms. So what we're gonna to wanna to do slowly is when we go from the left leg, it's gonna be left and then right left up. Okay, so we go back to the leg. You see my arms, I'm gonna go slowly. You can kind of pretend like you're slapping your pockets down and back. So as you go down, I'm gonna go slowly on the right, you slap your pockets on the way down, and then you swing your, or you don't really slap your pockets, you can pretend, but you swing your arms up, and that will help you jump high. So you wanna start on the left leg, and then it's gonna be right, left, up. And again, if you're left-handed, you start on your right leg, and you go left, right, up. Okay, so then you wanna create distance too. So if the net is that way, I wanna push off over here and jump. So again, we start here on the left, go right, left, and swing my arms. Right, left, swing arms up. And then you can do the spike. How are we doing there? That's an awesome activity, Josh. And I just put uh, in the um, chat box for folks as well, just those some of those written cues as well. So uh, it was, I believe, left, uh, when I put here, right-handed, start on your left leg, left hand, start on your right leg. If your students maybe uh, prefer one over the other, even though maybe the right hand or left, uh, maybe not left hand or right hand or whatever, maybe they're ambidextrous, uh, you can choose either leg, but then I also wrote in as well, Josh mentioned kind of the cue being right, left, up, or left, right, up. So fantastic activity, a great, uh, great way to kind of build off of the kneel jump, uh, getting that extra space up high, um, which you have a lot of experience of in your volleyball years, um, uh, making blocks and great plays at every level. Um, so thanks for sharing that. That was fantastic. My pleasure. Yeah, it's, um, you know, you realize as you get older, the importance of, of being physically literate when you're younger. Maybe you don't think about that and you take that for granted when you're younger. But um, yeah, you realize, well, you will be thanking yourself later in life if you start all these different types of movements now, because it really will be difficult to learn that um, later on when you're young and in your age, you know, your motor patterns, your brain, you're so... Um, malleable and adaptive you can kind of learn all these things and pick them up fairly quick um but uh i would say just do all kinds of different activities um by yourself in a team sports non-sports um every type of different movement you know a slow tai chi i don't know if you've ever seen people do that it's very slow and controlled or stuff where you know like volleyball or some other sport um where you're um very very active or uh the Spartan races where, you know, you're, you're going over some pretty incredible looking obstacles. So that looks very fun and challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm not sure uh, Take Me Outside team wants to jump in here, but I know um, we wanted to save some space for questions. And I think we have uh, some questions that are coming in, but I see Steph is back. So uh, Steph, if you'd like to jump in, feel free to take it away. Sure. Yeah. So I see some some questions coming in here. And if, uh, if any classes want to raise their hand to unmute and ask a question um, with their microphone, then please feel free to do that. We can call on you that way. Um, and so just use the raise hand button and we'll we'll see you um, flagging that. But someone wrote in a question so far. Um, H.S. Paul School asked, between your two Olympic Games, was there one that was more meaningful and why? Um, good question. Uh, meaningful. Yeah, they were different meaning. I think the first one was more 
uh, about me kind of because I, it was something that I wanted so much. So I was very focused on what that value proved for myself. And then my second one was more about um, not myself, like my um, family, um, fans, yourself, the, the next generation of athletes. I really, really was more for them um, and what my Olympic participation served and how it benefited their life and just in terms of showing them how appreciative I am one of my friends and family for their support because you need a support team in life always um, and two trying to inspire uh, you all uh, to be the next me and and see um, you know what how possible very possible it is uh, to be there so yeah I would say that's how they, they differ in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah I liked that you mentioned that it's not you know it's not it's good to start young, but it's also not too late. Like all through school age, you can be doing different sports and trying different things. And it's not like you needed to have started when you were four years old. You could, you can really try lots of different stuff and keep your passion. For sure. It's very common. Some more questions coming in. Um, which your favorite medal to win was, and someone wanted to see a close up of your medals. I don't know if you keep them on you at all times. <laughs> well, I do and I don't because I, I framed them. So if I'm in my office, they are. Um, so there's kind of the jersey from Rio. Um, and there's just a little mix of ones. Um, so I didn't win uh, an Olympic medal. I wanted to. Brazil ended up beating us out at home. I thought we were going to shock them in front of the world, but it was a pretty incredible experience. But these are the ones that I, I wore one on the world tour. So there's a gold, silver, bronze, and then the Maccabi games, which is kind of like a, a Jewish Olympics thing. So um, it's, uh, yeah, I kind of um, have, have them all in terms of, but, um, but really, I mean, of course we want to all win Olympics, there are medals and stuff like that. But and what I realized about the Olympic spirit and the movement is what it kind of stands for and, and how, like myself and everybody else, um, the values that you learn from that. So, but of course we all want to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned that of being able to travel to different places in the world and see the ways that you were different and also the ways that you were the same, especially in terms of sports and physical activity. Yeah, it was pretty, uh, I'm very fortunate because sometimes, you know, I probably wouldn't have had that opportunity to travel the world and talk to people from uh, different areas. And, and, you know, we think our way is the normal way. And then you talk to somebody else, it's totally different than they think we're the, you know, the different ones. So it's very, it's very cool to hear, um, you know, their way of life and how we're different, but yeah, then how we really share a common bond um, through our physical literacy. So that was uh, very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sue Matheson is wondering, uh, our class would like to know who your biggest supporter was during your sports career. Oh, that's toughy. Well, uh, my wife does at the time, she'd always let me know if I would have won a gold medal if we were together at that time, no. Uh, but, well, you know, my parents, obviously, you kind of have to say that, and, and my brother, just because there's, there's always times, I'm just fortunate to have them, but there's always times when we have doubts. I don't know if, if you all have experienced that as well, um, and, you know, you need people, friends or whoever to, to lean on, uh, especially actually going through high school, because there's the sacrifices you have to make where some people want to just, you know, do more social stuff or go, you know, play gaming or go out or stuff like that. And which is fine. You need that. But you need to I use that as a reward. But sometimes people aren't willing to sacrifice and do the hard work and study and, and train instead of doing that other fun stuff. And then they'll try to, you know, bring you towards that part because they might feel bad that they're not doing the sacrifices you are. So when you have people that love you for you and you're going to support you for you, um, yeah. it's less people overall, maybe not be as the popular emotion, but uh, those that do support you will be your true friends. Um, and it's definitely with that type of support group and I mean, it's quality over quantity as you'll realize later in life. So yeah, it's really important to have somebody you can kind of lean on and who will kind of love you for your choices and not pressure you to to do what the the calm you know popular thing might be sometimes mm -hmm. yeah thank you and i know uh Gosh. everyone watching josh has to go in a minute i'm gonna hand it over to the other steph from tmo for a minute here who's in her yeah. thanks can you guys hear me okay yep okay 
Uh, Josh, so as you know, I'm coaching volleyball this year. I have my senior volleyball team here with me today. We have one of our games this evening. And so they had a couple questions uh, for you just to ask, how can you communicate better as a team? And um, how could you stay motivated after a loss? Oh, great questions. I got to come and, and hang out for a practice, by the way. Before this yeah, season. that'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, great questions. Because volleyball, I mean, all skills, um, you know, there's momentum swings, you know, you're not going to be winning all the time, you're not going to be losing all the time. So it's like, how do you uh, stay optimistic when things are going well? And the communication is totally that because even if you don't uh, have a good play, technically, if the team is communicating, they're talking, oh, look, watch this person, they just did this. Uh, they have three hitters up. Um, or if, you know, you're, one of your teammates goes for a dig and misses it. If everybody's like, oh, nice try, like always talking. It sends a message to the other team like, whoa, this team is like engaged and they're like into it. It's going to be difficult for us versus, you know, I'm sure we've all seen other teams where just quiet and mopey, maybe and low energy. And then you, that gives you confidence. You're like, oh, they don't even really want it. You know, like doesn't matter how hard you spike it. It's how many, how much, what's your dedication to like dig the ball and not let it fall off the ground. Is everybody diving together and supporting? Um, and I think also giving feedback that isn't, you know, you don't, you're keeping each other accountable, but you're not taking it personally. Like, let's say the set is a little too high because everybody likes to complain to the center, right? But, um, you know, let's say, oh, it's too far or something like that. Um, maybe, you know, take some ownership and be like, oh, I'll, I'll wait a little bit, but maybe it can be um, a little closer. But it's nothing personal, right? Because you'd be like, hey, you weren't in your spot. Because in a team, whether it's volleyball or in a sport and life, and we all have our assignments to do. So if you attempt your assignment, you know, you're supposed to be in position five, right? and then you miss the ball, that's okay because you worry where you're supposed to be versus if you're just lazy and you don't know where you're supposed to go because you're not focused, then your team should hold you accountable and be like, hey, you said you were going to be in position five. We need everybody you know, doing what they said. So that's communicating, but also in a direct but um, still supportive way. But if you are doing what you're told and you're trying your best, and that's all that anybody, uh, your teammates or the coach can ask. Um, and then for a loss, uh, adjust because I think, you know, if we realize maybe it's a technical thing, was it 13, 14, the third set and you got scared and maybe apprehensively hit into the net, which I've done many times. So the next time you'd be like, okay, next time I lost that, I'm just going to go for it. At least whatever happens, happens. I can deal with that because I went for it versus got scared and tentative and apprehensive. That's a huge thing. So as long as everybody has support and be like, you went for it. I'm, I love that. Uh, instead of trying to be, you know, kind of shy at the pressure moments, that's how you can kind of learn uh, from the loss um, and really just ride the momentum wave because that's going to make the difference. For sure. Thank you. That's great. That definitely gives us some stuff to go uh, go back with and practice and work with. So thanks yeah. so much. And thanks for being with us today as well. My pleasure. Yeah. Contact me after about scheduling to come by for practice. Okay. That'd be awesome. We'll do. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, and, and I know Josh has to has to go because he actually has a patient he's got to see next. And so just sincere gratitude from all of us to take me outside and on behalf of PHE Canada and, and everybody who was able to join in and watch today and for folks will be able to watch the recording too. And so yeah, thank you, Josh, so much for your time and your insight and showing us all those activities too. <laughs> Yeah, I just really appreciate your time. And sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions, but feel free to, we, we put Josh's um, social media handles in the chat. So stay in touch with him that way too. For sure, you're welcome. All right, we're going to say bye to Josh and then we're going to give away prizes in a sec here. So thanks, Josh. Okay, my pleasure. Bye everyone. Take care. All right, so we're going to give away prizes here. So stay tuned for just a minute. I know it is no, 9.30 Pacific time, but um, I also just have to give a quick shout out to our partners here um, for everyone who's supporting day two of Take Me Outside Week of Health and Wellbeing Day. So um, our partner, obviously, PHE Canada. Thanks so much for your support and for giving away some awesome prizes that you'll see in a minute here. Uh, and Alyssa will drop those links in the chat for folks. Um, and the Outdoor Learning Store has also supported us with some awesome prizes and is our partner today, this week, and uh, every day of the year. And so check them out for lots of prizes or, or lots of resources and uh, learning supplies, things like that. And of course, MEC has supported this event to help make it possible um, and arrange all the amazing speakers and activities we could do this week.
I can't wait to see. I hope some videos and photos come through of the activities today because, yeah, I can see that it was probably a lot of fun doing it as a class. Um, and so for PHE Canada memberships, we have five of those to give away and a PHE Canada swag bag. So we randomly chose names from people who were watching with their class. And so I'll let Ryan announce some of them. And if you hear your name, please write in the chat that you heard it and send us a message with your email. So you can, in the chat, you can select that it either goes to everybody or just the hosts and panelists. So just let us know your email so that we know you're here. Awesome, thank you, Steph. And <clears throat> just to echo that, yes, drop your emails in. We wanna get you these free memberships and swag kits and some gift cards from the Outdoor Learning Store. Uh, so we have some winners. Drum roll, please. Uh, we have Allie Trix, grade seven, eight class. Congratulations. Uh, your educator is going to get a free PHE Canon membership, uh, which is good for the year. So congratulations. We got, uh, I believe we got Pearlene. Pearlene, congratulations. You got a PHE Canon membership. We've got Allison Mevis. So Allison, congratulations. You got a PHE Canon membership. Uh, no free cars today, unfortunately. I feel like we're giving away, you know, free. And you get a car, you get a car, no cars today. <laughs> Uh, Casey Elvidge, uh, you are a lucky winner as well. So again, send your email using the chat function to us so we can get uh, that information to you. Uh, and we have grade five E Annie, I believe. So Annie, if you're out there, um, congratulations. You have a free PHE Canada membership. Send us your email. And the lucky winner of the PHE Canada swag bag that we have here. Uh, today, it's full of some goodies from PHE Canada. Let's just see. Abita, congratulations, Abita. You win this swag bag. Send us your email in the chat function and we can get that to you. And over to you, Steph, for the Outdoor Learning Store. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm glad we have Alyssa here uh, keeping track of emails. So please, if you heard your name, do send us the email um, or else it can be a bit tricky to track folks down. So um, we have $25 to spend at the Outdoor Learning Store and the winner of that. And I'm just making sure that you're still here. Amazing. So Ms. Singh 5F, you have won $25 to the Outdoor Learning Store. Amazing. Congratulations. So send your email. Um, Oh, someone put, can you put the winners in the chat? We, <laughs> it wasn't to you, unfortunately, Kristen, sorry about that. <laughs> um, you could watch the recording too, if you want to hear the, the winners' names again. Um, so that with that, I'm going to end it there and just say thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to upload this recording if you want to rewatch, if you had any technical difficulties. Uh, and we hope you can join us for the rest of the week and all the amazing sessions that are coming up with speakers and activities and all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, please stick around and see you hopefully for the rest of the week. I put the link in the chat there for um, everything else that's coming up. So I'm going to stop the recording here.